Howdy folks, and welcome back to War Thunder with the Mighty Jingles. Today I'm going to be flying and talking about the Bell P-39 Aerocobra. The Bell Aircraft Company produced 9,500 of the Aerocobra family of fighters in western New York State between 1939 and 1944. The Aerocobra belongs to that unique family of American aircraft that had absolutely no success whatsoever in its country of birth, like the Northrop F-5 Tiger produced much, much later. The Americans really didn't like flying the Aerocobra. There were a number of unusual things about the P-39. It had a tricycle undercarriage, something that was quite new at the time that later became common practice on fighter aircraft. The most unusual thing about the P-39, of course, was that unlike most fighter aircraft up to this point, it wasn't designed around an engine. The P-39 Aerocobra was designed around a gun, the Oldsmobile T9 37mm cannon. The gun and the gun barrel were too big to be traditionally fired through the propeller shaft, as is usually the case in nose-mounted, cannon-armed fighter aircraft. So what the Bell Company did was that they mounted the engine behind the cockpit. This actually has a centrally mounted engine. Initially, pilots weren't too keen at sitting on top of the propeller shaft. It was initially anticipated that sitting on top of the propeller shaft could have disastrous consequences for the pilot if you were ever forced to crash land an Aerocobra, but tests were conducted and it was determined that in the event of having a, a belly landing you were really no worse off having a centrally mounted engine to a front mounted engine. The T9 cannon, however, was not all it was cracked up to be. It had a very low muzzle velocity of around 600 meters per second. It had a very limited ammunition load of only 30 rounds of ammunition, but most alarming was the ballistic properties of the shell in flight. It dropped a lot. Legendary US Air Force pilot Chuck Yeager said it was like throwing a grapefruit at the target. It also had a tendency to jam, and it would fill the cockpit with fumes when it fired. It was not a very well-liked weapon system. The one good thing about this 37mm high explosive shell, however, was any hit on an enemy aircraft did tend to have fairly impressive results. Nevertheless, the Bell Aircraft Company were having problems finding somebody to buy their innovative new fighter, and in early 1940 they were running into severe financial difficulties. France came to their rescue with an order for a substantial number of P-39 Aerocobras. Unfortunately, the Wehrmacht had something to say about that, and France fell before a single aircraft could be delivered. The Royal Air Force then came to the rescue and offered to take 200 of them off their hands, an offer which the Royal Air Force very quickly came to regret. Royal Air Force pilots hated this aircraft. The major issues that the Royal Air Force had with the Aerocobra was its marked drop in performance above 20,000 feet, which was ironic since the aircraft was actually developed in response to a requirement from the US Army Air Corps for a high altitude interceptor. The lousy performance above 20,000 feet was due to the single stage supercharger that was used in production models rather than the turbo supercharger which was used on the prototype. They also complained about the aircraft's alarming tendency to go into a flat spin. The Bell Aircraft Company were completely unable to duplicate any of the spin characteristics which were being claimed by the pilots actually flying the things. It turned out that the Bell Company were doing wind tunnel tests with a full load of ammunition, which moved the centre of gravity of the aircraft further towards the nose. But when the aircraft was running with an empty ammo load, this moved the centre of gravity towards the rear of the fuselage, something that wasn't actually confirmed in tests until the 1970s. Also on the list of the Royal Air Force's problems was the short range of 430 miles on internal fuel tanks and 690 miles with drop tanks. They also reported that fumes would fill the cockpit after firing the guns, although they did concede that the aircraft was the equal of the Bf 109 below 20,000 feet. Still, the British needed a high altitude fighter and they dumped their P-39s on the US Army Air Corps, and the rest of the order was cancelled. The Americans had even worse luck with their Aerocobras. When the USA entered the war with Japan, its primary land-based fighters were the P-40 and the P-39. The P-39 pilots had exactly the same problems as the British, and they also complained that the cannon often jammed. 
The air battles of the Pacific were fought at medium altitudes, which were optimal conditions for the Era Cobra. But the American pilots weren't facing BF 109s, they were facing ultralight, super agile A 6M Zeros and Ki 43 Oscars. The P 39, like every other Allied fighter, including the Spitfire, could not turn as tightly or manoeuvre as quickly as these Japanese fighters. The 37mm cannon was also not a very effective air to air weapon. It might only take one hit to bring down a zero, but the slow rate of fire and the drooping ballistic trajectory made it very difficult to get that one hit, and not all of the P-39s had the 37mm cannon. The Aerocobras that the British handed over to the US Army Air Corps had a 20mm Hispano in its place. This was called the P-400, which is also in War Thunder. It soon became the joke of the Pacific that a P-400 was a P-39 with a zero on its tail. But, 37mm or not, the 250 caliber and 430 caliber machine guns could still make short work of a zero. But the biggest reasons for the P-39's poor performance in the Pacific were a lack of knowledge about Japanese aircraft, numerical inferiority, and veteran enemy pilots. Most American pilots found the flaws of the P-39 unforgivable and requested transfers to P-38 Lightning units before the problems could be resolved. In US Army Air Corps service, it's fairly safe to say that the P-39 Aero Cobra was a dismal failure. Despite the general lack of love for the Aero Cobra in US Army Air Force service, one very famous American fighter squadron, the 99th Fighter Squadron, did operate P-39 Aero Cobras in North Africa in 1944. In February 1944, the 99th Fighter Squadron upgraded its P-40s with P-39s, if only for a few weeks before they replaced the P-39s with P-51 Mustangs, painted the tails red, and passed into history. The 99th Fighter Squadron, more famously known as the Tuskegee Airmen, or the Red Tails. They were, of course, an all-black American fighter pilot squadron, and were more famous for flying the P-51 Mustang. But overall, it is fairly safe to say that the poor old Aero Cobra was not loved by the Western Allies. However, it did see a lot of success on the Eastern Front. The Red Army Air Force operated 4,500 P-39 Aero Cobras, almost half of all Aero Cobras built, and they did enjoy great success with it. I'm just going to take a quick break from the history lesson here. There's three guys been on the tail of this PE-2 for the last minute. I thought he was going to be dead before I got here. Now, you may think this is kill steam. You're wrong. <laughs> I'm sorry if three of you can't put that guy down after sitting on his ass for a minute and I turn up and kill him. The problem doesn't exist with me, okay? Just saying. But back to the Eastern Front. Soviet pilots were introduced to the Aero Cobra in early 1943. Now, they too reported handling problems, primarily spinning. And they had trouble using the radio. For many Russian pilots, this was the first aircraft they had flown that actually had a radio but these complaints were relatively minor. Overall, the Russians were very, very satisfied with their new aircraft. They loved its low altitude speed and maneuverability, excellent structural integrity, and heavy armament. Most air-to-air -air engagements on the Eastern Front happened at low to medium altitude, which was the perfect environment for the Aero Cobra. Although there were a lot of misconceptions, primarily in the West, about the Soviet use of the P-39 in the ground attack role. It was competent in this role, but it wasn't the primary mission of Soviet Aero Cobra pilots. The priorities of Russian P-39 flyers and Russian fighters in general were protect ground units from enemy aircraft, escort bombers, suppress anti-aircraft in the area of bombers, reconnaissance, free hunt, attack soft targets, and protect high-value friendly targets. In early August of 1944, while flying over a tank battle in Poland, Alexander Pokryshkin told the T-34 unit commander, our cannons will not penetrate tank armour. The T-9 cannon, although at this stage was known as the Colt M4, had a muzzle velocity of 600 meters per second, and only had a rating of 1.41 kilograms steel on target per second. Theoretically, it could penetrate the armour of early panzers, but only the top of the hull and the turret. By comparison, the Russian NS-37 37mm cannon had a muzzle velocity of 900 meters per second, and a steel on target rating of 3.06 kilograms. That was enough to get through all but the Tiger's side or front armour. And instead of the M80 armour piercing rounds that were required with 
the M4 cannon. The Americans only shipped the Soviets the M54 high explosive shells, which were completely ineffective against tanks. The success of the Aero Cobra in Soviet service was not in the ground attack role, it was in the air to air role. Five out of the ten highest scoring Soviet aces scored the majority of their kills in P-39s. Grigory Rechkolov, the third highest scoring Soviet ace with 56 individual air victories, scored 44 of those victories flying Aero Cobras. During the war he was awarded the Order of Lenin, the Order of the Red Banner four times, the Order of Alexander Nevsky, the Order of the Patriotic War First Class and the Order of the Red Star twice. It's the highest score ever attained by any pilot with any American-made aircraft. And he was a Russian. <laughs> Which is kind of ironic. And so there it is, the P-39 Aero Cobra, arguably the most successful mass-produced American fighter aircraft that was not used successfully by America. As always folks, watch your six. And I'll catch you next time.